Uh, Mahir, tell me, uh, why is Silver such a remarkable spy and why has this story never come out before? Well, he's the most remarkable spy because, first of all, he was he's the only quintuple spy of the Second World War. He spied for five countries, all the three Axis powers, Germany, Italy, Japan, and then Britain and the Soviet Union. But what is remarkable about him is that he spied, in effect, for Britain and the Soviet Union against the Axis, absolutely defrauded them, in today's money, £2.5 million. Pounds. And then later on, when he wrote his book, because he was an Indian, and by then India had become independent, he felt he couldn't admit to the fact that he had spied for Britain, which then, of course, um, was ruling India. So he only admitted to spying for the Axis powers. So the story has never come out. It's only now that I've got hold of documents in this country and in Russia, which shows exactly what he did. And what sparked your initial interest in this author? I wrote a book about a namesake of mine, not related, Shubhaj Bose, who was an Indian revolutionary, who decided, after 20 years of fighting the British, that the war was the only way to get, get his country free. And he went over to Germany and then Japan. And in order to escape India, he used Silva, who was from the northwest frontier province of India, which is now part of Pakistan, to cross by foot from India to Kabul. And he sort of said, you know, you be my agent, uh, sort of report what is happening. And then the Italian um, minister in Kabul, Ambassador Kuroni, who was looking to attack, if you like, British interests in India, saw him as the ideal spy, the man who could go back and forth and, um, you know, help in bringing information and sort of cause some trouble for the British. I knew that part of the story, so I knew about this, but it seemed to me odd that he was going back and forth. He went back and forth 12 times during the war, and that the British never discovered him. You know, I mean, the British had a pretty good um, system in India. They would have had a lot of, you know, they had their police, their spies, and so on. So I, I wasn't very convinced, and when I wrote my first book, I raised some questions. But then I got, come, came across in, in, the, in the British Museum which has the India Office Library, which is a wonderful library. Amazing material, which I, when I originally written the book, didn't know existed. And then I went through all the papers in Q and so on, and I found this was a totally fascinating document, a fascinating story. And he worked with Peter Fleming in Delhi, deceiving the Germans, and it was Peter Fleming who gave him the name Silva. Right. And if the Germans are so organized, and they think of themselves as being so clever, why did they never rumble this? This is the most amazing story. What comes across is the Abwa, certainly in Kabul, was the most inefficient and the most gullible of people because Silva, and this is a man, remember, educated in India in an Indian educational system, albeit set up by the British, who didn't speak English very well. He spoke broken English. He spoke the local languages very well. And he kept telling them all sorts of stories. At one stage, um, uh, the Germans heard that one of Silva's most close associates had been arrested, who they, who they knew, who they'd met in Kabul. And uh, when they met him, they said, what about this guy? Won't he sort of squeal to the British, tell everything? He said, no, 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 don't worry. He's such a revolutionary. You know, he's gone through all sorts of tortures. He won't do anything. On another occasion, Silva himself was arrested, and they got the news. And he said, what happened? He said, well, there was a little demonstration, and I walked my way out. You know, by then, if you like, the Germans, in, it seems, they had a lot of, they had got to Kabul a lot of money. They had something like 23 million pounds in their safe um, in the embassy in Kabul. And they just thought, many of them, they just thought, this guy was giving them all sorts of fantastic information, which was really recycled from, from newspapers, readily available, and then added on. He, he had a, f a friend who was a fiction writer. So, you know, they, and, and the Germans had no means of checking, no means of checking. And towards the end, they might have got a hint. But by then, they were so, you know, so had been deluded so long, they couldn't admit to people in Berlin that, you know, they had done this because then, you know, their, their lives or their, you know, their whole future would have been in jeopardy. And even up to the 1970s, the German agent still believed that Silver was their man. Absolutely. Good? In 1973, um, Bose, who's a huge revolutionary figure in India, his supporters and family held a big seminar. And they invited Silver because they thought Silver had helped Bose. And they invited this man, Witzel. 
and he, he, it seemed at, at that point, till that point, when he met Silver, he finally, Silver finally told him, listen, I worked for the Russians and the, and, and the, and the, and the British as well. Until then, he refused to believe. And afterwards, when he, when he gave an interview um, to a friend of mine, the, the, the German spy master, he described Silver as a, as a freedom fighter and saw him differently. In fact, it was, you know, if you like, it was covering his back because by then... Because it was too embarrassing. Too embarrassing to admit. Yeah. And what comes out from this story is that the Germans, despite their reputation as being running huge military operations and huge intelligence operations, actually ran some very poor intelligence operations. I mean, one of them, the guy Witzel we've talked about, he knew a bit of Persian, uh, knew, uh, knew a few of the languages there, and his code name was Patan, which is, of course, how the local people in Afghanistan and that part of the world are called, and he spoke Persian with a very ge heavy German accent, and yet he wanted to be a Patan. He really believed this blonde Teutonic man could be a Patan, and he, and he once rode in a horse about 160 kilometers to pretend to be a Patan. I mean, it's that sort of, if you like, this is people deluding themselves, and, and Silver was the ideal guy, because he could spin. He could spin stories very quickly about what was happening. Um, and there's a great story there. Uh, this is when um, he's working with Peter Fleming in, in Delhi. Fleming calls him Silver. And he's walking the street in Delhi, and he meets an Afghan um, who he knew from Kabul. Then he comes back and tells Fleming, he says, you know, I've met this Afghan. And Fleming is very worried. He said, listen, if this Afghan is a government official, you know, you go back to Kabul, he will wonder what you were doing in Delhi, you know. He might work two and two together, and, you know, you could be in trouble. The Afghanistan was neutral. They wouldn't have wanted somebody wandering about there. He said, don't worry about it. And, of course, the way um, Silver worked was he would leave Delhi and from Peshawar walk. So, so once he left your thing, there was no way of communicating with him. He didn't know. For weeks he didn't hear anything. He got very worried. Finally he came back. And he said, what happened? He said, don't worry. I met the Afghan. I invited him for lunch at the flat. The flat which the Germans were paying him to keep in Kabul. And I mixed tiger's whiskers with the curry. And you know, tiger's whiskers have these little yes, claws. Little <laughs> yeah, and, and that was the last meal the Afghan had. I mean, you know, you've got to admire this guy, Skutzberg, you know, his, his sort of courage. And I got in touch with him when I wrote my original book on bows. And then he wrote me a handwritten letter saying, you know, you haven't sent me a copy and things like that. I mean, at that stage, I didn't know the truth. So I, I, that's why I think he's the most remarkable spy. To yeah. do this in that, and remember, he's walking. As a spy, I mean, there have been great spies, you know, um, uh, but they no normally operated from one area, one particular city. This guy is walking 200 miles by foot through tribal areas, which today is the land of the jihadists, posing to be a Muslim, he's a Hindu, you know, and then getting away with it and fooling the Germans, the Italians and the Spanish and, and the, and the, the Japanese. Terrain. Was horrific, wasn't Absolutely, it? and this is mountainous. this mountainous, up and down, hilly areas, you know, and where he would have to befriend the the tribes he's meeting. So he would, what he would do is occasionally the Italians and the Germans gave him explosives and so on. So these tribes who were fighting the British anyway, he would give them the explosives and things like that. So he would become their friend and then move on, you know. He, he did this in great style. Now the Germans had built up quite. Um, quite a sizable infrastructure and influence in Afghanistan, had they not? Yes, they had, because the Germans, even in the First World War, had tried to ferment revolt against the British in India through Afghanistan. They saw Afghanistan as the back door. This is the sort of... The, own German version of the great game. We've heard a lot about the great game that the British had with the Russians and all that. But the Germans had their own version. But after the war, this is between the First and the Second World War, the Germans sent in a lot of people. They sent in the Todd organization to build roads. They, they had a, even they had daily, they had flights from Lufthansa flights from Berlin to Kabul. And they had a lot of influence. And also, a lot of German women married uh, local Afghans. So there was, there was a lot of, and one of the uh, German agents had a dental practice where every other day the Afghan Prime Minister, Hasim Khan, had bad teeth. So every other day he was attending the teeth of the Afghan Prime Minister. And this guy who was a, a dreadful Nazi and an anti-Semite, he, he thought that he knew everything about Afghanistan. Because, you know, if you're a dentist and, 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 and somebody's in, in the de dental chair in front of you, you obviously think you have a lot of influence. He's, he's, he's going to tell you a lot. But so the Germans did build up a lot of influence and they did see Afghanistan as a place where they could have the back door to India. Because a lot of German experts 
experts did see striking the British in India as their way of, of, of if you like, um, gaining power in that part of the world. Yes. So how serious do you think Adolf Hitler's invasion plan was? I mean, it, it looks as if it was a back of envelope idea. And Hitler himself was terribly racist. Absolutely. He was terribly racist. He was also a great admirer of the British Empire. And he, he didn't want, you know, in fact, uh, after he, um, his, his success uh, in the Blitzkrieg and coming right up to the channel, he offered the British many times a, a, a peace. Obviously, it would have been a terrible peace that, you know, you keep the empire and, and let, me be, uh, let me be king uh, of Europe. But the, the point is, that while Hitler had those ideas, he still wanted to rule the world. And he did see the backdrop, because I don't think that from what these plans are, he did not want to conquer the whole of Russia. He wanted to conquer up, up, up to Moscow and Stalingrad and then move south. But, and, and again, if Hitler had not attacked Russia, if he had actually come through North Africa, he could have found a way into India. And, and there were sort of various alternative plans that they discussed. So he made a big mistake. He absolutely made a mistake. And Churchill admitted in his book that if Hitler had not gone into Russia, which of course changed the course of the war, and he, if he had gone into North Africa and come through there, come through Egypt and you know, places like that, through Syria and so on, he could have made a big difference and gone as far as the gates of India. Whether he would have succeeded there is a different matter, but certainly he, he, he would have made a difference. And he could have also exploited the fact that the Afghans saw the Russians as godless, you know, because they were a communist regime and so on and so forth. He might have, and, and there was certainly a local base there. Of, of, of Germans in Afghanistan, a big local base, and, and many of the Afghan um, elite like the Germans. Good. Well, thank you very much.